So good day to everybody and a very warm welcome from ICMA to this, our 14th annual Primary Market Forum. It's the first virtual one and the good thing is that means we can welcome participants from across ICMA's network, including Asia Pacific, for the first time. This annual event is an opportunity for us to gather together ICMA's primary market members from across the value chain, issuers, investors, intermediaries, infrastructure providers, advisors, and others. And this is an important part of ICMA's mission. We also seek to do this as part of our day-to-day -day activities. For example, linking together members of our corporate and financial institution issuer forums, a buy side, that's AMIC, primary market working group, and our underwriter committees in Europe and Asia Pacific. The primary markets are clearly pivotal to the capital markets as a whole. They are the conduit connecting issuers with investors. And of course, they're a big part of what we do at ICMA. And our focus is on market practices in the primary markets, and providing standards of good practice through the primary market handbook. We also look at regulation in which the primary markets function, acting as an advocate for market practitioners with the regulators and supervisors to ensure that existing and planned regulation does what it's supposed to do and allows the market to thrive. After all, the increased use of capital market funding in the real economy, rather than a reliance on bank funding is a policy goal in many jurisdictions, including here in Europe, and in Asia. Of course, we're holding this virtually because of COVID-19 and the pandemic has influenced everything that we do. As we know, central banks played a vital role in stabilizing the markets, and provided incredible issuance conditions, and the market has, has responded with record high issuance volumes in Q2 and beyond. The panel discussion on recent market trends and dynamics is going to address this. At ICMA, we support our primary market members with the practical challenges of dealing with the current situation through the following measures. All of our committees and councils, of course, moved to virtual format, and we continued our regular member discussions. In fact, we stepped up our engagement with central banks and regulators markedly, in particular discussing market conditions and regulatory timetables. Commercial paper, which some may argue has been a, a sleepy part of the market for years, has really come to the fore during this pandemic as an important part of central bank monetary policy operations. And you may have seen that we made our ECP documentation freely available to non-members for the first time for use with the Bank of England's COVID corporate financing facility. We've been publishing information on the operation of ICMA's standard force majeure clauses for underwriting agreements and recording regular podcasts and keeping our dedicated COVID-19 web pages updated with new information and materials. The pandemic has also helped to change the focus on sustainable finance, which continues to enter the mainstream. One very positive result of the pandemic has been the explosive growth of the social bond market with vast issuance of COVID-19 themed bonds. I'm sure that you've all seen the European Commission announcement last week of the issuance of Euro 100 billion of social bonds as part of the SURE programme, that's the Unemployment Recovery programme, which is due to start later this year. And they commented that the framework followed ICMA's social bond principles. We were concerned that the focus would drift away from the environment. But in fact, after a short lull in the pace of issuance, the pace has picked up right up. And it's great to see that the major national and regional recovery programs are hardwiring environmental considerations into both the issuer and disbursement criteria. We have a panel today on sustainability, and I'm sure that it will look at the latest bond market product, namely sustainability linked bonds, which are just starting to take off. ICMA continues to ensure that all our members, issuers, investors, and the underwriter community 
are helping to drive the sustainability agenda together, not only through our work as the Secretariat of the Green Social Sustainability Bond Principles, but also through the increasing regulatory engagement, particularly as we respond to the many consultation papers. For example, the complex paper on disclosures this summer as ESG considerations are brought into the legislative framework. In general, I think we're well plugged into this agenda with both the market and with regulators. And you may have seen that we were recently appointed to the new European Commission's platform on sustainable finance, which replaces the technical expert group where we were also a member. Apart from sustainability, the other mega trend in financial markets is FinTech. And here again, we're extensively involved. The number of initiatives which are focused on primary markets is increasing quickly. And you may have seen that we published the third edition of our primary markets technology directory on the 2nd of October. And this references a total of 35 technology solutions up from 28 the previous year. Other areas to mention include the transition to RFRs, where we dedicate a significant amount of resource to supporting our members in the transition away from LIBOR, both in Europe and in Asia. We're involved in the official sector sponsored working groups in the UK, in the Euro area and in Switzerland. This is an important issue for the bond markets as the end of 2021 approaches. And my colleagues, Charlotte Bellamy, Katie Kelly, and Mushtaq Kapazi will provide an update of where things stand and what is left to do later on in the event. We shouldn't forget what I call the bread and butter work that we do on other aspects of regulation and market practice affecting primary markets. This includes proposed amendments to the MIFID II product governance regime, market abuse regulation in Europe, market practices in Asia and Europe, including order book disclosure, and of course, keeping the ICME primary market handbook up to date. This is a huge task. And in 2020 so far, we've published over 200 updated pages. And I must say that we would not be able to do this without significant pro bono help from law firms. Amanda Thomas and her team at A&O, Paul Deakins, Julia Machin and Jessica Walker at Clifford Chance, and Lachlan Byrne, Catherine Wade, Sean Sanford, and others at Linklaters. Much of this work has been to update standard language and the process is ongoing as the law firms help us deal with the end of the Brexit transition period. It's still very unclear how this will pan out, but we will be prepared as possible. As a final note, I wanna mention that with many of us still working remotely, it's more important than ever to look out for our health and well-being. So we've rolled out a series of podcasts from the ICMA Women's Network and the ICMA Futures Leaders Committee. And these address issues on how to weather the storm from comments on mental health, career progression, and maintaining visibility in these challenging conditions. So that's it. I hope you find this primary market forum very worthwhile. I just wanna say how grateful we are to all those of you who work with us the chairs and the members of our primary market committees and working groups for all your support and for all your input. Without that, we really wouldn't be able to function. And I'd also like to thank our internal primary market experts, particularly Rory Ewing, Charlotte Bellamy, Katie Kelly, Mushtaq Kapazi, and others for their work in supporting this important constituency of members. With that, let's move on to our first panel. And this is on developments in sustainable finance. And I'm gonna hand over to our moderator, Nicholas Pfaff. Over to you, Nick. Martin, many thanks for the introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the head of sustainable finance at ICMA. And it's my pleasure to moderate the panel of sustainable finance this morning. I'm gonna start by introducing my uh, esteemed panelist, and then I'll uh, do a quick introduction before we get started. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Joanna Ko, who is the head of uh, responsible investment at Zurich Insurance. She's also the vice chair of the Green One Principles Executive Committee. 
We have Julie Becker, who's the Deputy CEO of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. And finally, we have Ila Krivi, who's a Director, Head of Capital Markets at the European Investment Bank. As Martin mentioned, uh, this has been a very rich year uh, for sustainable finance. We'd feared that there would be a, a slowdown, and in fact, um, it is turning into quite the opposite. Uh, we selected five themes to cover uh, today. We're going to spend the most time on the status of the EU taxonomy and the EU GBS. We are going to then talk to the new sustainability linked bond principles and the related product. And then we're also going to cover transition finance, social bonds, and if we have time, we're going to look at uh, the increasing role of sovereigns in the green and social bond space, which uh, Martin also alluded to. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by uh, looking to Ila Krivi, uh, who's a, a member of, also a member of the technical expert group and now the EU platform. And I, I was hoping, Ayla, that you could perhaps summarize the status of both the taxonomy and GBS. Over to you, Ayla. Uh, thank you. And uh, good morning to Europeans and good afternoon to, to Asia Pacific region participants. And thank you for this invitation. Um, so yes, this, uh, both the taxonomy obviously and the green bond standard have been long in the making. And um, perhaps on the green bond standard, uh, there has been a public consultation, which is part of the commission process every time they, they work on, on these new initiatives. And that consultation closed, I believe, on the 4th of October. And now they are going through the feedback and they are going through that with also the member states and uh, within the Commission Relative Services. And I think then um, afterwards, the decision will be taken what to do with the standard, um, whether to um, legislate on it, whether to put in place as a just a voluntary standard and, and in what form and shape. Of course, you have to remember that what the technical expert group was a proposal, a recommendation, uh, which is then up to the legislators to see if they take it or they adapt it or adopt it. Um, so that, that is in the making. Uh, of course, here one has to say that given that the Commission President uh, von der Leyen announced that uh, next year with the uh, with um, other program coming, the new generation EU, that one third of that should be done in the form of green bonds, it is of course interesting to see whether this will be then done under the EU's own green bond standard that, uh, that, uh, that certainly would um, would, uh, would point to that direction, but let's leave the decision to, 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 to those who are uh, entitled to take the decision. Um, on the taxonomy, uh, I think that's a bit clearer. Taxonomy as a framework uh, was uh, already adopted uh, last uh, June, or this year June, uh, but uh, it's, it's done at two different levels. So the fact that there is a taxonomy and the structure of it is done already now at the level of uh, uh, legislation. Um, the technical screening criteria, which are meant to be more of a live document, they can, they can be adapted more quickly and they can be changed and added to or deleted from as, as need be. Uh, they will be done at the level of delegated acts, which the Commission uh, services are now busy with. And they should be, I think the uh, idea that they should be, it may be done by their recommendations now by the end of this month sometime. They have a quick public consultation again. And then the technical screening criteria for the two sectors that have been worked upon, i.e. climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, would be then uh, done uh, by the end of this year and can be, uh, can be used uh, formally from, from 2021 20, January onwards. Um, then um, again here, one has to remember that technical screening criteria that the TEG proposed were again recommendations. And then um, the, 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 the commission can uh, can uh, adapt them if they if they feel uh, like it, and I suppose it's fair to assume that some small adaptations will be done, but uh, nothing points to the direction that big changes would be done compared to the, what the tech was recommending. Um, so this is where we are. By the end of the year, we should be a lot wiser, both in terms of the taxonomy, which we know will come, and then also in terms of the green bond standard, which will still have to wait in terms of 
if it will be uh, adopted and in which form. Ayla, uh, staying with the, with the taxonomy uh, <laughs> longer, um, you know, is the just for, for for our listeners who spend less time on on the topic than you and I um, uh, for our sins have over the last <laughs> three years? Um, is the taxonomy just a, a set of of um, uh, technical criteria? Is it just telling you what is green, or is it a bit more complicated than that? Well, uh, telling what is green, there are two things, or actually three things. Let's say that uh, you build a wind uh, wind farm, then of course that is first green. Uh, that is green without any thresholds because wind energy is green per se. But you also have to um, uh, assure that you are not doing any significant harm to other environmental factors. So, for example, you should not be building your wind farm, let's say, on some um, good uh, uh, or, or some land which is uh, which would destroy biodiversity, for example. Uh, you also have to make sure that you observe certain minimum social safeguards, for example, that the land has not been confiscated from people who have been driven out of their own lands. Something, these are just very sort of gross examples. But you have to have these three examples that your uh, investment or project contributes to the green, to whichever area of green, and it doesn't do harm to any other aspects of environment. And third, that it is observing the minimum uh, social safeguards. So this is what the taxonomy uh, says. And I think the two latter aspects are very important because uh, uh, since being involved in all this green finance and green bond market, these are the questions that you have heard in, in practically all conferences where somebody said, yeah, but what if, what if your solar panels have been fabricated by child labor? Is that then sustainable? And then you said, of course, it's not sustainable. But now you have actually a framework to put this into the right places that, no, it's not because it does not observe the minimum social safeguards. So that's the, uh, that's the way that, but the, the taxonomy is supposed to be uh, worked upon. It's not uh, finished and we have only tackled two out of the six defined environmental objectives. So, so far, the two objectives related to climate change are now pretty much done. And then the sustainable um, uh, finance platform of which both ICMA and EIB will be uh, members of, um, will have to tackle the, the four other uh, environmental objectives, which would be um, biodiversity, circular economy, um, everything related to water and then pollution prevention, if my memory is correct. So this, uh, this will all be worked upon by the, by the platform. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, uh, Julie, turning, turning to you and, and to the, the work of the Luxembourg uh, uh, Stock Exchange, which has you know, achieved real leadership in the finance space in, the, uh, uh, in, in recent uh, uh, years. Um, you know, Ela, Ela told us that the, um, the EU GDS was, was still very much a proposal, but can you tell us if um, both the EU GDS and also the taxonomy are already impacting the market and, and being referred to in, in, in transactions? That's good. Good morning, uh, Nicola. Good morning and good afternoon, all. So um, what we typically start to, to find um, in the documentation uh, and whether it is a green bond framework or the second opinion, even the use of proceeds of uh, final terms of prospectuses and, uh, and even in post issuance reports, we find reference to a claim of alignment with EU GBS and uh, EU taxonomy, a commitment to future alignment, a reference to EU environmental objectives, issues try to map the projects and they even name the environmental objectives they want to uh, comply with. Um, they refer to NACE codes and activity. Um, they also make reference to compliance with the uh, uh, technical screening criteria, but not always with the do not significantly harm, which is uh, sometimes uh, maybe more difficult to reach. And uh, we can also find reference to minimum social and environmental safeguards. But uh, I guess it's important to underline that uh, there cannot be a firm commitment from green bond issuers to comply with the EU taxonomy uh, and, uh, and the green bond um, uh, GBS, uh, as, as uh, Ella mentioned, as long as RTS are not yet uh, available, uh, they cannot say that the bond is fully aligned with the taxonomy, which is not uh, completely final. 
Um, so rather than a commitment, uh, you can find, for instance, in the framework of Daimler, that uh, it aims at following best practices. Uh, Caisse Française de Financement Local claims to strive to align with the EU classification system and the EU GBS. Uh, Deutsche Bank mentions uh, in its green finance framework that care was also taken to reflect the latest reports on the EU GBS and EU taxonomy and that potential changes uh, of the GBP this time uh, or developments with regards to EU GBS and uh, EU taxonomy will be reflected in the future versions of the framework. Um, you heard also about uh, the sustainability bond framework from uh, Luxembourg, uh, which has um, mentioned that the framework has been designed to comply with the draft uh, EU GBS. So from a legal point of view, it's very interesting to underline that uh, it's a commitment to comply with the draft. And it's even mentioned when relevant and feasible. And in the use of proceeds section of the framework, it's also mentioned that uh, the eligibility criteria of green activities comply when applicable uh, with the recommendation of the TEG and on a best effort basis. So it's no uh, firm commitment uh, nowhere, but um, it's also interesting to mention that it's not only in the framework that it is uh, the, the, the alignment of the green uh, eligibility activity criteria with EU taxonomy is uh, stipulated, but also in the second opinion. Um, and uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability has uh, assessed the alignment of the framework with both uh, the draft uh, EU GBS and the current version of the EU taxonomy. Um, last but not least, and Ella knows it uh, better than me, EIB also has slightly uh, changed the wording in the use of proceeds section of their final terms for new issuances to make a reference to the EU taxonomy by stating that the proceeds of the notes will be allocated in line with the evolving EU sustainable finance legislation, including the EU taxonomy regulation and the related technical expert group conclusions. Um, a very last example to share with you is the one from Communal Banken that has mapped its criteria for green activities against the activities included in the EU taxonomy. And a distinction is being uh, made between uh, criteria in accordance with activities, principles, and threshold and criteria which are in accordance with activities principles, but currently differ uh, with different thresholds that are applied. And it's worth again underlying that uh, if they cannot comply uh, with the threshold, it's because uh, they are missing data. And Communal Bank can make this very clear. For instance, in the production of electricity from bioenergy, that's because they are missing data, that they are unable to comply with uh, the thresholds uh, foreseen in the uh, EU taxonomy. So um, that's something also we are uh, observing that it's quite difficult for uh, issues sometimes to align with the threshold foreseen by the EU taxonomy as they are very ambitious and the path to align the, uh, to the EU taxonomy is therefore very narrow for some of them. So what, from what we see at the LGX, um, this is clearly one of the main issues, if not the biggest, uh, even more than the cost of verification. Um, but having enough projects eligible with the current EU taxonomy constitutes a, cha a real challenge. Um, however, the good news is that issues dare to use the EU taxonomy, even if the RTS are not yet finalized. And so it's important to give uh, enough transparency to investors about uh, that kind of commitments from uh, those issuers. And that's clearly what, uh, where exchanges have a role to play and what we aim to achieve with our LGX Data Hub. Julie, thank you. That was that was really interesting, and particularly the the specific examples. It really illustrates how how uh, the, the market is you know trying to find a way to to align with you know what 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 remains a a a, a, a transitional uh, uh, period, as as Ela underlined. Again, the EU GBS is just a recommendation, while the the taxonomy at least has a legislative framework, but the technical criteria are also in many cases still proposals. So we're we're really sort of um, again, in a, in a, in a transition. Um, I'm going to uh, change topics now and, and, and turn to uh, Joanna, um, who, as I mentioned, is, is, is also the, the, the vice chair of the GBPXCOM, in addition to her responsibilities at, at Zurich Insurance. Um, and um, I wanted to, to, to ask you, Joanna, about, about the work that the GBPXCOM has done in support of sustainability linked bonds with the, with the new principles that relate to them. And, and start by asking if this is a complete departure from practices that we've established already 
in the use of proceeds bond market, so green and social and sustainability bonds. Thank you, Nicola, and also from my side, hello, everyone. Um, no, I wouldn't call it a departure. I would say it is a um, complementary instrument to show up a second complementary way to the use of proceed bonds that we know to reach the same target, which is financing um, environmental or social outcomes. So if we take a step back from um, the green and social bond principles have revised their vision and mission this year. And that really is to champion green social and sustainability bond and related markets in order to drive finance to those social and environmental outcomes by making sure that we uphold the integrity through issuing guidelines and best practice that are focused on process and transparency. But now there are two avenues. So we, we do have um, the use of proceed markets that we're all very used to, which have four principles, which show how we show transparency of projects that fulfill a certain social or environmental impact at the end of the day. We have in over 10 years of experience and, and large growth in green and social bonds, however, found out that there are market participants that also are active in improving their sustainability credentials but that find it hard to work through projects um, and or the amount of volume required in projects in order to be able to issue those benchmark bonds frequently to set up the framework. So we took um, some inspiration from the sustainability linked loan markets to devise a different instrument. And I think what is very similar is it's been created by the market, the market participants who are experts in those fields with that view of what needs to be done to uphold integrity, again, in structuring the process and transparency around five principles this time, that allows to take the company view. So it's really about a corporate that makes a sustainability pledge that sets a target, but then doesn't work through projects, but actually gets to invest that money on a general purpose in order to advance. So rather than looking at the specific projects, in this framework, we look at an entire corporate that promises to get from A to B through investing a certain amount of money, but it's really up to them how they do it. So if you want, we move from project management to kind of management by objectives by structuring it in the same way through principles and transparency. And for those that are new to the SLBP, those five components that are important to keep is you do set, the corporate does set a key performance indicator that is linked to sustainability. So it's either an environmental or a social one. We'll set a target on that or a set of targets if there are multiple, which are the sustainability performance targets. Those of course have to be comparable, benchmarkable, and in order to maintain the integrity, achieve a certain ambition. Um, then the bond characteristics will change based on meeting or missing those targets. Um, so far, we've seen examples that most of the time were um, coupon step-ups. Of course, there needs to be reporting on progress, specifically on hitting those targets. And given that most of those targets missing or hitting them is connected to a financial reward, that per definition makes them financially material. So of course, meeting or missing those targets needs to be verified. So it's the, K the KPI selection, the calibration of the sustainability performance target, bond characteristics that will change the reporting and the verification of those five um, new categories that, that we look at in the SOPP. So we would say same, same, but, but different. And we really hope that those two complementary um, instruments will invite everyone to the market who has an ambitious sustainability journey ahead of them in order to achieve that mission of channeling money to those targets. Joanna, that, that was very clear and comprehensive, comprehensive at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie, turning to you again as to how this is translating in, in the real world. Uh, you know, we, we issue the sustainability linked bond principles from the uh, green bond principles in June and, and then not much happened <laughs> for, for about two months. <clears throat> and we, we wondered if it was just the summer holidays or, or had we done something wrong? And then uh, what has been interesting is we've, we've really had a succession of transactions, but also announcements in support from the official sector, particularly from the 
European Central Bank. Uh, but you've actually seen a few of these transactions coming across your desk. And I was wondering if you could comment on, on how this is working in the real world. Yes, sure, Nicola. <laughs> well, first of all, um, it should be pointed out that, uh, as Joanna just mentioned, uh, principles are more prescri prescriptive than uh, the GBP. But, uh, but concretely, they are uh, very well thought out by the market participants. So even if there are more pillars to comply with, uh, issuers seem to comply with all pillars and even uh, with recommendations only. Um, so what, what's interesting here and very specific to the sustainability linked bond principles is that um, KPI and sustainable performance targets should be embedded in the legal documentation. So they are legally binding and they triggers a legal liability of the issuer. That may be the reason why you haven't seen so many issuers uh, <laughs> popping up in the market immediately after the release of the principles. And um, that's also the reason why, because it's legally binding, on the one hand, it's respected by the market participants. And on the other hand, often, if not always, um, um, the sustainability link bond are subject to a pressure external review or second opinion, even if only recommended by ICMA and not on a mandatory basis. But for the four sustainability link bonds that have been issued in the meantime, they do all have uh, a second opinion. Um, what is always uh, taken seriously as well is, uh, is the following, the methodology used for the KPI, the determination of the targets, and the consistency between the targets and the KPI. This is a common denominator of the four uh, SLB yet issued in the market, even if we lack data about uh, OCA, uh, a shipping company in, in France. Uh, we uh, also have of course, Novartis in Switzerland, Chanel uh, in France as well, um, and, um, and Susano, uh, who issued a, uh, also uh, a sustainability linked bond. So all uh, takes uh, those uh, criteria very seriously. About, about the targets, uh, it's also interesting to underline that even if they come from different sectors, uh, Chanel and Susano have the same targets, which are CO2 reduction and energy efficiency. Uh, indeed, it's areas where it's easier to measure impacts. For Novartis, it's more uh, social, uh, about social impacts and it's more difficult to measure, but they suggested metrics uh, via the number of patients that are treated uh, with the new drugs. Um, so they mentioned patients reached with uh, strategic innovative therapy or their flagship, uh, flagship program. So they have defined specific pharma dedicated uh, KPIs. So what we do uh, on LGX is that we decided again, uh, as we did from uh, the beginning with green bonds, to put the bar higher and uh, ensure the integrity of the market and the comparability of that kind of products uh, by making uh, those principles mandatory on our, on our exchange. Uh, so in particular, what we uh, make um, mandatory is the selection of KPI and the calibration of STPs, like the pre-assurance external review, which is anyway, uh, so far at least, uh, fulfilled by, uh, by these issuers and the post-issuance reporting. So, so far, three out of the four issuers of SLB would be eligible to uh, LGX. Julie, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and it's uh, very interesting your comment about how, you know, the, to, perhaps to some extent when you're doing sustainability linked bond, you are entering into to a, you know, um, a level of, of detail in the legal documentation, which, which leads to careful preparation, let's put it that way. Um, okay, we're, we're now going to, to try to cover the, the, the three remaining uh, uh, topics, um, which are all extremely important, but we're, we're constrained by time. So I'm going to, to turn first uh, to, to Joanna again to talk about um, some very important work that is being uh, done at the moment, which hasn't yet led to a publication, but, but we're hoping to, to publish before the end of the year. And this is on the, the, the critical topic of climate transition finance. So Joanna, can you, can you enlighten um, our, our uh, participants on, on where we are and what we're trying to do? Of course, happy to. Well, obviously, I mean, when speaking about sustainability and the big work that needs to be done, one of the most interconnected risks out there and one of the most urgent things on our agenda is the climate change and, of course, mitigating the risk of runaway climate change. Now, there has been a big discussion of, you know, the level of green and Ayla has talked already about the taxonomy and how the EU is thinking about it. 
but we felt that in the market there was a big need to understand what is green enough when we speak about climate? What does climate transition mean? And how should issuers addressing it really talk about it? So um, end of last year, under the Green Bond Principles, we established a working group that would look at climate transition finance and how to define it and how to parameterize it. They brought together the biggest working group that we ever had in the history of the GBP, so that was great, but of course also took, took some time and, and a lot of skills to, to bring that together and bring it forward. But those of you that have probably been at the annual general meeting of the GBP have heard the very interesting things that happened. So there were roundtables. We also reached out um, beyond the member base of the GBP to really bring in expertise of what climate change transition means. And a big debate in the market was how good is good enough, right? Would, would transition from quite brown to medium brown, is that enough? Or do we need to move from medium brown to green? And I think the resounding feedback that came through surveys was, we don't have this time anymore. Nowadays, if you speak about climate change transition, it doesn't matter where you start, and it might take you a couple of decades, but the end point has to be Paris in mind. It has to be net zero 2050. The question is then, how do you speak about it? And there was enough discussion about whether that would be a different instrument. But at the end of the day, we have two instruments. We have the use of proceed instrument that, of course, climate change mitigation is one of the core objectives and the categories under the GDP. And most of the issuance uh, under the GDP has a climate focus, not all of it net zero transition based, but that's uh, where we already have a lot of expertise. And now the new SLBP, we have seen uh, quite, you know, two out of the, the, the three new ones have also climate transition and energy efficiency at their core. So both instruments are eligible. What the market needs is guidance of, if you say climate change transition, and it needs to be this end target of Paris aligned, how do you communicate it in which framework? And that's what the working group is um, focusing on. And we are, as Nick has said, um, hoping to, by the end of the year, publish this guidance that will show you no matter which instrument you use, if you have a climate change transition strategy as an issuer, which are the elements of transparency and of stringency you need in your documentation to really back up that this is transition, to call it a transition focused green bond or a climate transition sustainability linked bond or any other label. We see a lot of creativity in self-labeling those instruments in the market, which uh, Frankly, investors are not always happy about, but we see through <laughs> what it is. Um, and, and, and that's the idea and the guidance that will be given. So stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're working on publishing it. And, and I can already say I'm, I'm quite impressed by, uh, by the content. I think it's very useful for both the issuers to communicate, but also investors to kind of read through what, what makes a good climate strategy and what, what elements are needed to communicate around it on an issuer level. So that's what will happen. Joanna, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, to turn now to uh, Ela. Um, uh, Martin, Martin mentioned in his, in his introduction that this has been an extraordinary year for, for social bonds and, and, and sustainability bonds, which, which make social and, and green. Um, um, we've also had the European Commission come out and say that they're going to do 100 billion euros of issuance with this, with this product, which is, which is an extraordinary number. I mean, that's almost the entire size of the, the outstanding uh, issuance in the market. So, so Ella, please, please enlighten us on what's happening. Uh, well, um, I think I, well, we, 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 uh, I know pretty much as much as anybody else, because it's, uh, I'm, I'm not an insider at the commission, only at EIB, uh, which is not at all the same thing. Uh, but uh, I think that the fact that uh, that they are issuing uh, that the Commission will be issuing 100 billion up to uh, of social bonds, and those social bonds which are labelled social, but also they are, as Martin said in his introduction, they are aligned with the uh, with the uh, ICMA uh, social bond principles, which I think is a great uh, uh, decision to have taken because uh, we have seen this year a lot of issuance which has been COVID-19 related or sustainable this or that, but without uh, following the GBP or SBB uh, guidelines. So I think that such a huge public sector issue takes the, the effort to put in place a framework and align it uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the SBBs and to have a, an opinion on it all. This, this is 
fantastic news for the market. And I think if they do it, it's very difficult for a lot of other people to claim that it's too much and they can't do this. So I think that was a very welcome sort of new benchmark for that uh, for that market. So um, I think this is, uh, and as you said, almost doubling probably the outstandings of social bonds. Uh, so I think this is fantastic news and I'm very much looking forward to how it goes. I haven't time had, uh, had yet to look at their framework, I will. Uh, but if they say that it's aligned, I'll take their word for it to, to start with. So I think this is great news and a great milestone for this market, which, uh, which has been a bit smaller, but now it doubles in one go. Uh, and then I guess next year we can expect some similar news on the green bond side as well. So, so to me, this is, uh, this is uh, excellent news. And, and, and Ella, um, you know, coming to the substance of social bonds, um, is, it, is it as straightforward as with green? I mean, green, you know, we were talking about the taxonomy earlier and, you know, you can, you can mm -hmm. set technical criteria um, and there can be, you know, a scientific uh, basis. Um, now, what about social? I mean, how does one, without well, going into obviously too much detail, but, but, but how, does, how does one um, uh, actually focus the use of proceeds of a social bond um, uh, when doing that kind of transaction? Well, I think the, 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 the social bond principles are there to give you some guidance, but obviously the sectors are unemployed people, uh, health sector, education sector, and, and, and so on and so forth which are the obvious ones uh, to, to start with. And this is unemployment programs, here, especially that this TUA program is targeting. And um, earlier this year, when this COVID-19 um, pandemic broke out, uh, some action was taken also on the uh, GBP, SBB side um, to expand the notion of a targeted population, which was used to be something, a narrower a group, which now means that actually with a pandemic, you can have the whole population as a, as, a, as, a, as a target, basically. So I think this was an important step to take. You still have to have criteria, you still have to have definitions what you're doing with it. But I think the pandemic made it just clear that it can be just about anybody. It doesn't need to be only people who are underprivileged uh, socially or financially. Um, of course, pandemic tends to hit them harder as well, like any, any uh, sort of um, uh, problem in, in, in life. But I think this was a, this was an important notion, and uh, and uh, hence made it possible also for this program to to happen. And other people have been using this window as well, and will probably continue to use. Thank you very much, um, Ella. Um, uh, I'm going to finish coming back to to, to Julie, and, and and in fact, there's a there's a, a clear segue here where you know we've been talking about the. The, the European Commission coming into the market with with potentially massive programs, both for social and and and, and green bonds. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, Julie, what what about the role of 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 sovereigns? Uh, uh, you know, the Commission is is a supra, but it's perhaps the same SSA uh, uh, space. But what do you think are the peculiarities of, of, of sovereign issuers in this market and, and, and their role? Well, I think um, sovereign issuers clearly need to lead by example. Um, COVID has brought um, forward a number of innovations and uh, sovereign and specialized financing institutions um, have shown the way with COVID-19 uh, response bonds. And uh, the emergence of more sovereign activity, as we saw uh, last month and last weeks, uh, can clearly become a, a game changer like uh, the European Commission uh, share program in the sense that it creates a size and depth and liquidity to the markets. And that's really the, the game changer. Uh, also with, uh, with the European um, so share program for social bond issuance, it, it will really create a liquidity never imagined six months ago and uh, to be topped by the next generation EU funding program. Uh, so I think that they are really exciting time for, for sustainable finance and governments have uh, really understood that rebuilding economies uh, in a better way, uh, the famous building back better, must pass through sustainable financing instruments. And um, do, you, do you think it's, it's, it's more, and this is perhaps a more also, a, a, you know, more general question, which, which Ela may, may, may wish to comment also. I mean, is it is it more difficult for for a sovereign to to issue in you know a, in the project 
space. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a company and you've got either an asset or a project, it's relatively straightforward to do a use of proceeds bond. But but what happens when you're a, when you're a sovereign and you're talking about budget expenditure? You know, is 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 that is that something which is is you know which there's a track record? Is that a problem? What I can only say, uh, based on uh, what we we, um, we heard from from the Luxembourg government uh, when when we pushed this uh, this issuance already a few years ago, uh, is that uh, unicity of budget and fungibility of accounts may be uh, uh, the main obstacle for sovereigns to issue that kind of, of bond. But so far, uh, we now see that they managed to uh, to get ring fence deals done despite all of this. So uh, I think there are numerous remedies at the end and they can, they can manage the willingness is there. But Ella, you want maybe to add something? Yeah, yeah no, and I'll just continue that, that, that of course this is not accounting wise the same money that needs to be coming from the bonds going to a certain use of proceeds. It's that the numbers have to match. If you borrow a billion, you use a billion in the way that you have promised. And it depends on the government. Some have maybe a visibility over, over a longer period in the future, what they intend to do, and they can do this in the, the way that they define it in advance. Then, for example, we saw what Germany did, is that they did do it afterwards because financing and refinancing are both possible. Uh, they see what has been used first, and then they sort of uh, allocate it afterwards. So uh, I don't think that there's such an excuse a very valid excuse, at least, that it's more difficult for, 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 for sovereigns. I think there are ways to do it as well, just as there are for corporates, for banks, uh, for lots of other people. So it takes a little bit of work at the beginning, but if you do the work properly at the beginning, the maintenance is a lot easier. And I think it's just, just the accountability here increases for everybody, why you borrow and what you, you do with the money. I can probably it's also from an investor view, it really comes down to being able to explain what you do, right? Because also every sovereign is different of how they split spending between the federal and the more um, regional levels or even municipals. So there are some governments who can have big projects that happen on a federal level and others, you know, everything is so um, pushed down into the regions that on the sovereign level you have tax credits and R&D left. But as long as that story matches and you can't convey it well, and, uh, and you do it with purpose and also make sure there is no double counting between the bond systems on the federal and the regional levels, then investors will certainly be happy to do their due diligence and, and understand or give feedback if uh, the framework doesn't hold up. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, we've been um, um, very disciplined. We're actually bang on time, which is, which is remarkable. So, so I, I would like to, to, to thank uh, Joanna, Ela, and, and, and Julie, who are all remarkable leaders in the sustainable finance space. I thought that was a very interesting panel. And with that, and thanking you again, I'm gonna turn back to Martin Scheck. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Ayla. I absolutely agree with you, Nick. I think it was an absolutely first class panel addressing some of the really key issues on this um, ubiquitous theme nowadays of uh, GSS bonds. And uh, great to have so many of the industry leaders on the uh, panel today. With that, we'd like to move on to the next panel, please. And this is the current primary market trends and topics. And I'd like to introduce Lucy. I've just seen you switch your camera on, Lucy. Very nice to see you. So as Lucy Perkins, who is Head of Securities and Asset Management at Lloyd's Banking Group, who's gonna moderate this panel and introduce the rest of her panelists. Thanks, Martin. And good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, depending where you're zooming from, and welcome to our panel discussion. As Martin said, I'm Lucy Perkis, and I head up the Securities and Asset Management legal team at Lloyds Banking Group, advising our DCM and securitization desks. Today, we're looking at current trends and topics in the primary markets, and I'm joined by an all-women panel from across the value chain in Europe and Asia. So if I could start by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves, well, hi, good morning, good afternoon for those in Asia. I'm Christina Serone. I'm the Director of Corporate Finance and Funding for Rio Tinto, uh, basically in charge of making sure the, the company uh, remains, um, you know, has availability of funding in, in the corporate debt markets and in the, in the debt markets. And Carla? Um, 
Uh, my name is Carla Gooch. Uh, I joined HSBC back in 2003, and I've worked in a few different offices and businesses there over the years. So I've spent the last 15 years in Hong Kong uh, working in the DCM team. Um, it's been fantastic to be part of the incredible growth of this market in that time, uh, and I'm currently heading up the syndicate desk for the region. Anna. Oh, thank you. So uh, my name is Anna Xu. Uh, I'm part of the banking legal team for JP Morgan. I'm based in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm uh, the co-head uh, for Capital Markets Legal uh, for Asia uh, banking business. And Jenny. Good morning and good afternoon to those of you in Asia. I'm Jenny White. I work in the capital markets team at BlackRock. I'm responsible for our investments in investment grade and high yield debt in Europe, uh, covering issuers and speaking directly to syndicate desks to represent our interest in primary markets. Great. So we'll be covering a range of topics, including market practice efficiencies, ESG, IBOR if we have time, although there is an IBOR panel following this one, and what's on the horizon next year. But in a year that has challenged the resilience of economies and financial markets globally, and literally upturned our lives, we're going to start by looking back at 2020 and the impacts of COVID-19 on primary bond issuance. From the unprecedented shock and volatility in Q1 to the surge in issuance in Q2. Carla, perhaps if I could come to you first, how was it on the syndicate desk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've seen, as you say, some historic uh, changes this year. I think as we started 2020, we were looking forward to a relatively uh, BAU 12 months ahead. Um, but uh, as the COVID story moved from China to Asia to, to one that was truly global, uh, we saw markets become increasingly volatile and risk off uh, over the course of March as uh, the impact of the pandemic became clear. Um, uh, however, as governments and central banks uh, pumped an unprecedented amount of stimulus uh, and support, uh, into economies and into markets. Uh, we saw those markets uh, abruptly reverse course to uh, a fairly um, healthy risk on tone. Primary markets have certainly um, uh, uh, reacted uh, to those broader trends. Asian issuance um, effectively dried up in March, but has returned um, quite strongly uh, and picked up steam from April onwards. An interesting um, uh, comparison with uh, the U.S. and Europe, where issuance was actually uh, very, very strong in those in those more stressed months. In that period, uh, we've been able to deliver some really exceptional outcomes um, in terms of record low coupons, uh, a huge increase in in ultra long dated tenors, um, and some very interesting and innovative uh, structures and products. One of the interesting things that we find ourselves uh, in now about the markets is how uh, financial markets in general uh, have very much been on a tear uh, while we're in an environment of continued uh, uncertainty. So uh, for the time being, primary markets are certainly very constructive uh, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, a busy few months into the end of the year. And, and that dislocation, that decoupling of the markets from fundamentals, no doubt created opportunity as well as downside risk. Jenny, was that your experience on the buy side? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I would uh, echo some of the things that Carla said there. <clears throat> I think quite interestingly, in, in Europe, we had really a very busy start to the year. Q1 and Q2 especially were extremely busy, particularly on the corporate side. Um, and I think something that we found quite interesting was the global, global dynamics that Carla mentioned, the differences between the US and Europe in terms of quite how much volume we saw. Um, as, as Martin kind of alluded to in, in the intro to this, this session, uh, he talked about the differences between the reliance on banks versus the reliance on the capital markets. And that really played through in Q1 and Q2. In the US, we were seeing volumes up over 100% year on year because the capital markets were really where all of that emergency liquidity, all of that emergency funding was coming from. Um, it was a little bit different in Europe. We were certainly up in terms of volumes, but you also saw issuers more reliant on bank funding and, and getting some of that financing via their banks. But I think what we saw as a very important theme was how well issuance was absorbed. Um, and, and Carla already spoke about the unprecedented levels of stimulus 
undoubtedly that was a very large part of how well this record-breaking volume was absorbed. But I think there are a few other points I would pick up with regards to the resilience of our market. Um, Carla spoke about the, the Asian market slowing down, and there was definitely periods in March when European markets were quieter, but they didn't close completely. Markets were open, issuers did have access to capital at a price, um, and those levels came back very quickly. And actually, we're seeing levels um, very much back to where they were earlier on in the year. Um, and to your point, that meant that there were some, a number of very attractive um, opportunities for investors to really take opportunities where levels had been wider and have come back now. Um, and, and that resilience and that absorption was really a positive sign for us. And I think a lot of people were concerned that with 90 plus percent of the market working from home, we wouldn't be able to absorb that. But I'm very pleased to say that the market really did absorb all of the issuance and, and react very well to, to the ongoing situation. And, and given what we're hearing on liquidity and volume, Christina, how was it on your side as, as an issue through this period? Yeah, so it was a very interesting period, particularly uh, because at the beginning with all the uncertainty brought on by uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. the first task of a treasury team is to go back to basics. Uh, so as a corporate issuer, the first thing you want to know is what's my liquidity position? And obviously this is part of the day-to-day -day of treasury, but it kind of brought it into focus. Um, and you know, sometimes treasuries, and in our case, we operate with an operations team based in Singapore, and we have the corporate finance team, which I'm part of, based in London. So we have, although we're part of the same team and we're integrated uh, as a team and we report to the same treasurer, there's different focuses between the two teams. So they have the short-term focus at the operations level, and we have the long-term focus at, at the corporate finance. And I think that the immediate, thing we had to do to, is just to make sure that we integrated our short-term views of, on liquidity and our um, long-term views on liquidity. Now, luckily for mining, this, this um, COVID-19 hasn't had the impact that maybe has had in other industries like um, you know, hospitality because they saw all of a sudden a reduction in, in revenue. But in our case, it took a good couple of months to get reassurance, obviously, as we saw uh, commodity prices evolving that uh, our problem was not a short-term problem in terms of liquidity and as Jenny was saying you know in Europe a lot of um, uh, the, the corporates were relying more on on banking so we didn't have to go to, 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 to get a kind of a emergency liquidity line but we had this debate on whether over the long term because we didn't have a short-term problem so over the long term do we want it to first kind of ensure you know a, lo a, a longer um, uh, revolving credit facility or do we want it to issue long-term paper? And it was very, very tempting for us to issue long-term paper just because, you know, the, the coupons are really low. Uh, but because, uh, you know, by looking at the numbers and the scenarios, we didn't see, you know, a, a, a drop in liquidity that, that justify, you know, having incurring the cost of, uh, of carry of, of, of cash, then we offer with that. Uh, so we kind of use the, the bond market as a first stop and we're still working through that more as a, as a long-term solution. But I think, uh, you know, I think that the crisis just made us uh, go back to the basic, but now that the, the dust has settled and I think short-term is no longer, uh, short-term liquidity is no longer the, the issue. I think it just brought renewed focus on, on data and how we can leverage so many other parts of the business and applications and, and systems that can help us get a better prediction of what uh, the liquidity of the group overall will be. So some, some, some of the learnings that we had uh, from, from, from this crisis. And if we, if we look at some of the COVID market practice developments, I mean, in the UK, we moved between supporting clients that wanted to access the CCFF, the UK government scheme, to supporting you know, waves of new issuance, often on accelerated timelines. It, there was additional complexity from a disclosure and execution perspective, but my impression was everyone adapted really quickly. Anna, does that chime with what you saw on the legal side? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, when, when I was asked to think back on the past uh, 10 months or so of this year's uh, your execution, the world roller, roller coaster came to mind. Um, I think starting from end of January, 
uh, we saw a number of events impacting deal execution, obviously of issue, issue clients at the same time. So, you know, we started out with the COVID impact in, in Asia, uh, starting with China and then spreading to Hong Kong and, and elsewhere in Asia. And then Europe was hit and then US and then it became the global pandemic as we know it today. And then, then we had, before we uh, got, feel like we got a handle on COVID related impact and, and the ch challenges it presented, then we had the unprecedented uh, negative oil future price. Um, that was also something new that we, uh, we had to uh, deal with on a deal execution side. And this is impacted more than uh, wide, wider than banking, obviously. Um, and then the, on the US China trade tension side, uh, there was also, there were also abundant uh, issues for us to work through. And you know, starting with the Huawei situation, now with Tencent, um, all sorts of entity lists, and that's also ongoing. Now, um, because as you mentioned that the market was also volatile, um, the, the trend that we've been seeing out in APAC, I'm sure it's also the many, many other places in the world, that the, the deal execution timeline became more and more compressed. Um, so when we're dealing with all these unprecedented events, uh, compounded by the short, shorter and unpredictable market windows, that we, we are facing with a lot of execution challenges, as you mentioned, on diligence, on disclosure. Um, we, we had to work through on, on every single transaction, every single issuer, even where in the past it would have been very routine. We're looking at investment grade company, repeat issuances from, from the past uh, years. And even for those issuances, we needed to, um, just look extra closely at what is the exact specific impact on the company um, for and what is the related disclosure that we should be sharing uh, or should be urging the issuer to share with the investors. Um, so I think by now, um, I feel that the market has gotten to a pretty good pla place after uh, going through all these challenges. Um, and I, and now that we also have a number, a couple of quarters of financials come out, um, the impact of COVID and also uh, the geopolitical events are now showing through more clearly through the financial performance of, of the various companies. So I think that that pressure is, is off a little bit. But as we all know, uh, we do have the US election coming up and other events probably unfolding uh, for the rest of the year and continuing. So um, uh, we're bracing ourselves for a busy rest of the year, as Carla said earlier. And, and actually one of the things that surprised me is how well everyone adapted to the new sort of virtual world, the, the working from home, whether it was e-signings or, you know, just everybody being in their own home. Um, Carla, what, what was your experience? Yeah, absolutely uh, agree with you, Lucy. Um, uh, I think if we look at, uh, we've all obviously seen how much our lives uh, and our work has shifted as a result of COVID. And I think what's interesting is how some of these developments have um, in many ways been constructive and perhaps been very, um, have given us a push in a direction that is, is going to be a long-term positive. Um, I think in the primary markets, the key impact that we've seen from COVID um, uh, has notably been a continued functioning uh, of our market, but also how we've had to adapt. And probably the biz biggest example of that is um, previously uh, time-consuming physical roadshows is very much a feature of the new issue process. Issuers would travel to multiple jurisdictions, multiple regions over a matter of days or weeks on long-haul flights. Uh, that has clearly changed uh, this year, and uh, very, very quickly the market moved to entirely virtual format. Uh, that's had the benefit for issuers of allowing them to uh, significantly shorten their execution uh, timelines, um, getting in and out of the market much faster. It's also been very environmentally friendly, no more need for, the, for, the, for all of that flying around. Um, 
So, uh, and I think what's also, you know, pretty uh, notable is that we've been able to do transactions for debut issuers, for new structures, et cetera, in that time period. So clearly the market has, um, has adapted to that very quickly. Um, I think another thing that allows us to, uh, that another thing that kind of the new remote working allows us to do is to be more resilient to future shocks and other surprises. And we have a perfect example of that today in Hong Kong. We have a Typhoon 8, which basically closes the stock exchange and in the past has meant that uh, credit markets are more or less closed, liquidity and secondary very light. You would never see any primary supply. Uh, today, for the first time ever, we actually have two transactions out in the market. Um, so that would not have been possible uh, before COVID, and clearly uh, we now have an environment which is much more resilient and adaptable to a range of challenges. Yeah, very interesting on the potential long-term benefits of those efficiencies. Jenny, w w was that your experience? Has that been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think Carla touched on it. The, the virtual roadshow point is probably the largest impact that we've had. Um, clearly, there are benefits. Um, it allows issuers to have accelerated timelines. We've, we've talked about the uh, environmental benefits. Um, there are definitely benefits on our side as well. It takes less time for analysts to go to meetings, to get to meetings, all of those elements. But I do think there are pros and cons to these accelerated timelines that we've touched on. Um, certainly from an investor perspective, the amount of work you need to do to an analyze a company is still the same amount of work. So when those timelines get compressed because there aren't long haul flights and there aren't lots of meetings, suddenly the three to four days which you had to do your analysis is now a day, two days. And I do think that there are, there are some arguments for the slight extension of that process, even when we're looking at virtual. And, and we have seen some situations like that. We've seen situations where even though the roadshow was virtual, there was still an extra day for feedback gathering because there is still a lot of work to do. And so I think there are definite benefits, but we are seeing some challenges. The number of issuers that are coming to the market in shortened timelines does put quite a lot of pressure on the buy side in terms of preparing for that. Um, but I think there's also an element of when, as and when, hopefully soon, we're allowed to meet each other and, and meet face to face. I do expect some meetings to go back to face to face because there is often a benefit, especially with new issuers or very frequent borrowers, having those interactions face to face. You know, seeing the whites of someone of someone's eyes and actually having a conversation. So I think we'll probably end up moving to a, a hybrid model. We will see plenty of issuers doing virtual roadshows, but periodically issuers will also do face-to-face -face meetings just to get that interaction with investors. And, and Christina, from an issuer perspective, did you see um, practical changes, benefits from the sort of new working environment? Yeah, I think I, I would touch on, on two, two topics that we experienced, even though we didn't you know, within the issue of bond, we were active updating our European debt program, which um, impacted our disclosures. And there's also the roadshows because we, we, we do them every year, uh, non-deal roadshows. So I think on the roadshow, I mean, it was um, amazing. I mean, we, we always do it physically with investors in the US and we do it periodically with investors in Europe. Um, and I think obviously it was amazing to be so efficient, you know, delivering, the messages to a, lot, a broader audience uh, in a much compressed period of time. Uh, I think in the future, potentially, we will have a mix because we've, we notice the level of engagement from investors when it is a call or even a video conference. It's very different to when you actually sit down with them and, and have a conversation. So obviously, there's benefits to the roadshows, but there's also when you want to kind of uh, in, in improve or, or have a, a deeper conversation and making sure that you make, make your points uh, across um, um, more strongly. I think, I think there's a lot of value in, in, in the physical meeting. So yeah, we'll see how it evolves when the world opens up and people can go back. And also in terms of disclosures, um, I think um, COVID-19 um, uh, was, was, was a big challenge because um, uh, I, I know it coincided with kind of the peak of the crisis when we had to uh, uh, update our disclosures and, and risk. And 
obviously auditors were very keen for us to be very specific about the COVID-19 risks that were impacting the company. And it was too early in the days for us to be very, very, very specific about, yes, this is the risk and I, I can assess a, a number. So I think that that, that was, a, was a big challenge, but you know, luckily, uh, as I said before, uh, for mining companies, the, the situation kind of stabilized very, 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 very briefly. So, yeah. And, and connected with that theme of sort of long-term benefits, um, and a theme that reflects the fragility we've seen as a result of COVID, there's significant focus now on a more sustainable recovery you know, at all levels, political, economic, and social. So if I can come to you, Carla, do you see the, a link with the rise in ESG this year? And do you have any views on initiatives in that space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that this topic really picks up on some of the themes that were addressed in the previous panel as well. Um, the need to create more sustainable financial markets, more sustainable economies, um, has clearly taken on increased urgency in a post-COVID world for a number of reasons. But it has very much, I think, moved up, moved up the, the agenda, and very rightly so. We've seen a real uptick in interest from both investors and from issuers in the entire ESG universe. I think over the course of this year. Um, that certainly includes green, which is, you know, kind of the traditional ESG product. We've been doing quite a lot of those transactions uh, for issuers really across the Asia region. Certainly see that, that our colleagues are very busy on the same front in Europe and the U.S., um, but also on um, some new products and some innovative solutions. Uh, and among these are, are the COVID response bonds. They were mentioned on the last panel. Um, we were involved in the first ever international COVID response bond, which, which did, uh, this product did get started in Asia uh, back in February for BOC Macau. Uh, we have another one out actually out today out of Korea for Shinhan Cars. Uh, so it's very clear that this is becoming more and more topical across the entire ESG spectrum. And Anna, on the legal side, um, you know, obviously all of this creates, you know, there's, there's opportunity there, but there's also risk. And I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on the sort of disclosure side for ESG or, or, or just generally the, the, those themes. Yeah, so definitely echoing what the others have said and also the previous panel on, on this trend. And we've seen um, the, the green and, and social bonds um, and, and other types of similar bonds and different labels coming to the market. And I think the disclosure um, and diligence and, and the part continue to focus on the use of proceeds um, and, and how would the, I think, I think that's pretty much it and the framework uh, building. So, you know, JP Morgan is very active in it and uh, it's, it's very topical because last week we, we made a uh, announcement around the, the alignment of Paris Agreement commitment. Um, so I, I think the market, as Carlos saying and others, you know, we do expect to see uh, quite a lot of uh, green and sustainability financing come to the market, um, both in the bonds and, uh, and loan space. And Jenny, I know BlackRock are very active on this. Do you, do, so do you see it as a really long-term trend in terms of the sort of rise that we've seen this year? Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, it's a topic that we're very vocal on and, and we work very hard on as a firm. I think the biggest test, and, and Carla talked about the amount of issuance we've seen and, and the different types of products, but I think there's, a, there's another angle to this as well. And that is this crisis was the first real test for the ESG investment product. So if you look at ESG funds and how they performed through the crisis, this was the first real test of how will they perform versus their non-ESG peers. Um, and I think the resilience of that product in, in the vast majority of cases, those funds matched performance or beat the performance of their non-ESG peers. Um, and the resilience of that product um, is, a, is a really positive for the investment side of this. And we expect that to make more focus on, on that product. And it's certainly the case that a number of people thought that COVID-19 as a crisis would take um, people's focus away from ESG, but actually very much on our side, the focus is increasingly on ESG. Our clients are continually asking and pushing on this area. So it's, it's certainly um, heightened the focus rather than, than just the focus on ESG for us. 
And Christina, it's a challenging topic for many industries. So I just wondered about, you know, on your thoughts about facing into those challenges from your side. Yeah, no, I think um, integration of ESG in the investment decision by investors, both in the equity markets and fixed income markets, will just continue. And we're very mindful of that. And we've been mindful of that for, for, for some time. And we are aware that ESG uh, is, is a financially material factor when you look at a, at a company as a whole. Um, and I think COVID-19 just brought that more to the attention. I think at the beginning, yes, you know, the first month you are focusing on liquidity. But then after that goes away, I think, you know, all the impacts around the social component, the governance component um, uh, brought on by COVID-19 are very, very tangible to corporates. And I think, you know, there's, going, uh, there's a renewed effort just to make sure that although sustainability is in part of how mining does businesses, I think the expectations from society and the expectations from governments about how we conduct our business are changing. And obviously we need to adapt and, and we have this, you know, we have this long-term ambition to meet the, the Paris uh, Agreement targets on, on, on emissions. But I think obviously the, the pathway to get there because of the technologies that are available are still um, a work in progress. But I think um, mining companies are completely aware that this trend is here to stay. And uh, we're making sure that, you know, sustainability stakeholders have, normally been, you know, in the mining context have been different people, no investors. So we're working really hard in treasury just to make sure that the needs uh, of investors are taken into account when we communicate and when we disclose our, uh, our um, KPIs. Now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, I wouldn't say it's, it's a difficult topic because it's such a ESG, such an evolving ecosystem. And, and so, you know, finding the right spot where you can use the sustainability um, instruments to kind of link your sustainability to your finance strategy. I think this is where, you know, companies in, in, in which are carbon intensive need to be very, very mindful about how we go about doing this. But I think there's, there's only one direction and there, there's no way around that we, we have to work um, to make sure that we link both sustainability and finance strategy. Conscious of time, so moving on to some non-COVID market practice issues and whether you see scope for further efficiencies. Jenny, do you have any views on that? Yeah, so I think, as we said, COVID has brought us a number of efficiencies in many ways, but actually there's still quite a lot of scope within the capital market. So if we look at just the kind of primary capital markets on the uh, investor side, the process is still very manual. There are still lots of processes that require human input multiple times from every investor kind of across the board. So there's still a lot of scope there. Um, and ICMA certainly do a lot of fantastic work on this. Uh, they have a, a directory, and, and Martin spoke about it earlier, that provides details of a number of these initiatives. I think the challenge for many of them is that they are not quite to scale yet. The problem with the capital markets is you really need critical mass for something to take off. So it, it, it's, it's a work in progress and we're definitely getting there. But it's not just about changing the whole scale capital markets. Small changes could make huge differences within this, this space. I think the thing that is my, my biggest bugbear and, and the people from ICMA are probably fed up of me talking about it, but is, is access to documents and documentation around transactions. So it's reasonably easy at the time of a new issue to contact the syndicate desk or the relevant salesperson to get hold of the documents you need. But if we are six months, 12 months down the line, accessing the documents for a transaction that could you know, remain in, in trading form for another 10, 15 years maybe, accessing those documents can be really difficult. Um, finding the right place, you know, it's, it's, if you know where to look, it can be okay, but you might be looking at a stock exchange website, you might be looking at the company's website, you might be going on Bloomberg. The process itself is not hugely aligned. Um, and so it's little things like that that could make a huge difference from a time perspective for people like me, um, as opposed to wholesale changes to the way capital markets work. Really interesting that with all the focus on the content, the issue for you is access. 
Um, and, and on the subject of disclosure, Anna, I know there were, you know, there were recent changes, obviously, in Hong Kong with the amendments to the Chapter 37 disclosure regime. Yep. Any thoughts on whether that will bring efficiencies on your side? Yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately not in charge of how the technology is set up uh, there <laughs> to, uh, to see how it will work uh, from, a, from a user perspective. But I think that that will be a welcome change uh, for most market participants. Uh, there are some limited uh, exception to uh, that requirement of publication going forward, but I think uh, hopefully uh, it will it will be made public and, and easily accessible um, by by all the users. So maybe um, you know after it's implemented, Jenny, you can tell uh, tell this group and the the others uh, next year how how this has worked for you uh, for for you to locate. Uh, bond prospectus is uh, filed with Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And Christina, what about the issuer side? Uh, any thoughts on your side for, in terms of efficiencies? No, I think, I mean, we still find the process of going to the markets very difficult, as you said, manual uh, on, you know, producing the documentation and getting ready to be in the market is still like a long process. And uh, when the actually time of issuance comes, you know, um, you know, you, you would like to have more visibility about what's happening behind the screen and how the allocations are being made. Um, so I think, I think technology can solve a lot of these problems. Now, from our experience using technology in a different product, not in, in the bond context, we know scalability is an issue. We, we, we did a pilot of blockchain uh, for an LC, and, and we, we have become very familiarized with the issues of having these technologies kind of taking off. Uh, but we look forward to, to that happening. So as issuers, we can actually access the market more easily and have more transparency about how, you know, the, the whole process uh, unfolds. And this year saw significant volume in updates where disclosure was being adapted for the first time since the EU prospectus break came in last year. So did that involve significant work on your side, Christina? And do you think it yeah. a real difference? Yeah, I think it, it did. I think I think aspects. I mean, I think the the intention of of the uh, changes to how we report risks or the prospectus makes sense. You know, just to make it more specific, just to have materiality, just have a ranking. I think that's that that that's all, all perfectly good. Uh, uh, you know, objectives in, in the new regulation, and I think it, it helps companies to uh, kind of have a, a more. Um, be more mindful about how they go about this, this risk so they're more informative. Now, the, the problem is we have, you know, uh, when we were trying to be more specific, for example, about a certain risk, we were trying to be mindful not to kind of change the meaning of a similar disclosure we had in another document or that we may have in, in, in other prospectuses. So I think that was the, the tricky part, just to make sure that everything aligns. And, and obviously it was... Um, it, it was a lot of work and we also found afterwards we compare different prospectuses uh, and I, I think implementation is, is diverse but hopefully next year when everyone is under this new um, you know covered by this new regulation we can see uh, best practices and, and also you know um, more um, uh, more alignment uh, among different issues. And Jenny I don't know whether you noticed those changes this year. <laughs> Uh, I have to say that the day-to-day -day impact on us was pretty limited. Um, we're always uh, supportive of greater accuracy and disclosure and, and more disclosure, but um, I wouldn't say that the day-to-day -day impact for me was quite as material as it was for Christina. So moving now to a topic that represents a seismic shift for the global markets, eyeball transition. We've already seen transition in the front book to Sonia, and we've also seen some LM activity on the back book. But I think everyone acknowledges the scale of the task to the end of 2021. So I'd like to ask each of the panel for their views on market readiness and the challenges for legacy bonds. Christina, any thoughts on your side? Yeah, so we, we have worked really hard on understanding our exposures. Uh, so that has been kind of uh, bulk of the work and also identifying where it makes sense to uh, have full bank languages. Obviously, when it's an external document, uh, you know, in very seasonal transaction, we need to have a full bank language uh, early on in the process, but that doesn't take away the risk and it doesn't solve it. So I think, um, I think, I mean, we've done as much as we think we can in terms of 
understanding where our risks are, our exposures are, engaging with lawyers to kind of draft plans. But I think we have felt a little bit limited by how slow the market practice of, of, of LIBOR um, has been to actually implement the changes because you don't want to, you know, do little, little by little when you have billions and billions of dollars and kind of hundreds and hundreds of documents, you want to do it hopefully once and, and get it done. So I think, I think it remains a challenge and, and we look forward to, you know, having uh, the market setting the standards and the conventions so we can move on and, and move our documents to, to, to where they need to be. And Jenny, given the challenges, are there particular call outs for you? Yeah, so it is, it is a challenge. What I find quite interesting from my perspective and my focus purely on the primary markets, actually in, in my world, the transition has been happening for a very long time. You know, Sonia related instruments are the focus for us. We are not looking at historic LIBOR references. And I appreciate that not every market is at the same point that, for example, the UK bond market is at. But the, the primary market in, in the UK is, is, has moved to that. So I think our, our secondary focus is on the liability management. Obviously, we've seen those in co covered bonds. We've seen them in ABS. We started to see them in capital instruments. So there is definitely progress there. And we kind of continue as a firm to work towards that. I, I ap appreciate Christina's point that it, it's a little bit chicken and egg. Some, there needs to be some big steps made so that others can, can happen. Um, but as, as a firm, it's something that we continue to, to push on and, and work actively. It's really the responsibility of everyone in this market to get us to an eyeball transition um, piece. And it does feel like there's going to be quite a lot of heavy lifting in 2021 to get us there. Indeed. And Anna, from an Asia Pacific perspective, perspective. Um, what's the sense there? Obviously, it's be interesting to hear given the, the sort of dislocation and timing between the markets. Yeah, so we haven't seen a lot of uh, floating rate instruments uh, out here. And uh, it traditionally also has not been a feature of the market here from what I see. Uh, but to the extent we the, the ones that, that do come to the market, uh, my, my sense is that it seems to be quite well covered. Uh, by external counsel uh, in this market. Um, and I also see a lot of efforts internally, especially on the loan, loan side and other, other business uh, desks in, in following the developments and implementing the changes in, in our documentation. Um, and I think that there, I have to say that I do appreciate and seeing a lot of collaboration and sharing of knowledge and developments with both within our firm and also in efforts led by uh, organizations such as ICMA um, to, to make sure that whatever is happening in, in London and elsewhere, um, you know, we are getting the real time updates as to what the global uh, development and trends are. And, and Carla, how about from a syndicate perspective? Um, I think it's very much, it, it, we have seen different approaches in different regions, as Jenny has, has highlighted. Some regions are, have made a lot of progress, some regions are still working on it. Um, I think here in Asia, the liability guide activity um, for the new reference rates perhaps isn't quite as advanced as in some other markets. Um, there can be a number of reasons for that, so this year the interest rate environment has generally favored uh, fixed rate uh, issues. Um, some investors, particularly on the bank treasury side, are still setting up their systems for the new reference rates. Uh, and outright lending uh, in the new reference rates, um, in some cases, is not yet widespread. However, in our discussions, um, uh, particularly with bank and corporate treasurers, they are very focused on this as an issue. And I think, you know, to kind of echo Christina's comments, um, they are very keen to see these, these practices bedded down um, so that we do have new market standards and, and we can all kind of move ahead with, uh, with business as usual. Conscious of time, so I'm going to move on to our final topic, which is looking ahead to 2021. And I'd like to ask our panelists for their thoughts on the sort of major market themes or issues coming down the track next year. Jenny, if I could ask you to take that one first. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, look, I think I would echo a lot of what was said in the panel before us. Um, ESG has been a focus for a long time, but we expect ESG to be more and more of a focus in 2021. I think particularly within the sustainability linked bond space, 
Um, so if we look at the most recent announcement from the ECB stating that they will um, accept sustainability linked bonds as collateral going forward and they, they will be part of their CFPP program, we expect that to remove one of the major hurdles for European issuers in printing that product. Um, we are seeing more and more of that product come through. We, we're seeing a sterling deal just today. Um, so we're expecting that to be the big focus. Um, we expect most of the conversations we have in Q4 to be around that topic with the aim of looking at more issuance from Q1 when the ECB will start to buy that product. Um, I think the view from our side is that it's important that the standards are right with regards to that product and ICMA has done some great work on that but it's also around looking at on a sector level what the appropriate targets and KPIs are for those transactions um, so that's something that we kind of encourage issuers and um, the, the banks that represent them to do more investor work around that to speak to investors and find out what the right areas are and, and speak to the experts as well um, to determine what the appropriate areas are. So we expect that to be uh, the biggest focus for 2021. Um, there is also an element to say that we would expect potentially lower volumes in 2021. A number of issuers, um, as we alluded to throughout this panel, came to market in 2020 with emergency financing, um, emergency liquidity to get them through the pandemic. And in many cases, they're now awash with that liquidity and they, they really don't need financing in the short term. So in the very short term, we're expecting Q4 to be a much quieter period for volumes partly because of the US election, but also because of this dynamic around uh, pre-financing in a lot of cases. Um, but we also expect uh, Q1 next year to potentially be quieter as well because of that financing and, and niche was being kind of well prepared with their, their liquidity position. So uh, our, our big focus is on the ESG conversation into the end of the year and into Q1. And Anna, how about from your side? Um, I think, uh, given how many surprises we've seen uh, in every single year that we've seen in the last past few years, uh, it's really hard to make any predictions. Uh, I think um, I, I would, if I have to uh, predict anything, I, I think it will, we probably will see some uh, a surge in the green bond and social bond space. Uh, other than that, I think it will be uh, you know, probably, hopefully another, um, exciting uh, year and uh, and hopefully we will uh, have a lot of issues that we have dealt with the challenges we've bedded down uh, this year ho hopefully will be become more of a BAU next year. And Carla any market views as we look forward to 2021? Um, yeah I mean I think uh, I think certainly we, we do expect a busy few months ahead of busy uh, 2021. I think kind of a key question from my side is which of these sort of, it's been a difficult year in many ways, but it's also been one with a lot of opportunities and which of these opportunities and greater efficiencies can we really kind of bed down? Um, you know, the remote working has been a, a big plus uh, for, for many. Uh, virtual row shows uh, has had a lot of benefits um, and the acceleration of the ESG agenda, all of these have been really good things. So I think looking ahead, uh, we want to make sure that we're, we, we, uh, we go back to a perhaps just slightly more um, that this is usual world in many ways, but that we retain some of the improvements that we've made over the past few months. And finally, Christina, what do you see on the horizon next year? Uh, I think I think for corporates, you know, when, when you have go, gone over this hurdle of, you know, and um, there's not going to be short-term liquidity issues, you start thinking about this new environment of low interest rates and what are the implications for corporates. Uh, you know, whether it's in terms of, you know, your capital structure or it's in terms of, you know, how you manage your pension, uh, you know, liabilities to your, you know, cash cash in the balance sheet. I think we're at US, US dollar functional company, so we're no, I, I guess we're not used to this environment of low rates and this dislocation between potentially future dislocation between inflation levels and interest rates and, and how we, we, we manage those things. And obviously ESG will continue to be um, a, a very important topic to, for, for, for corporate treasurers. And just to add, I think on my side, I think supporting the COVID recovery, subject of course to what we see happening in the coming weeks and months, given the increasing restrictions and talk of second lockdowns, et cetera, 
and supporting, you know, as, as everyone has talked about this morning, a more sustainable future. So the, the ESG and managing through your eyeball transition will be some of the key themes keeping us busy in 2021. I suspect some of us will also be navigating the new Brexit landscape. Um, so that brings us to a close, and I'd like to say a big thank you to our panellists, Christina, Jenny, Carla and Anna, also to everyone who joined on Zoom, and to Charlotte Bellamy and our friends at ICMA for organising this event. And with that, I'll hand back to Martin. Thank you very much, Lucy, and I'd also like to thank Anna, Jenny, Carla and Christina. I thought that was an excellent panel. You covered really all of the, uh, the key themes, things I took away from that were the importance of liquidity, short-term and long-term, market access, difficult as disclosure during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, evolution of primary processes, fintech overlay, LIBOR, and uh, of course, uh, sustainability uh, on top of everything else. So it really covered the, uh, the waterfront there. Thank you very much indeed. And the, uh, the discussions on the um, challenges of uh, transitioning to LIBOR I think are a very good segue into our next discussion, uh, which is going to be on the uh, global RFR transition effort. And uh, very pleased to uh, welcome my colleagues, who most of you already know. So Charlotte's just uh, uh, switched on her camera. That's Charlotte Bellamy, Senior Director in Market Price and Regulatory Policy at ICMA. We have Mushtaq Kapazi. Mushtaq is our Chief Representative in Asia, uh, based in Hong Kong. Uh, very, very engaged. He's a managing director, is on our executive committee. And Katie Kelly is, uh, I don't see her camera yet, but uh, she's there. And she's also senior director in market practice and regulatory policy. And we're extremely um, engaged in this particular transition. And I won't um, go into what's going to be said, but I'd just like to comment on what a complex transition this is, how global it is, and how the interdependencies, both geographically and across product just make it uh, uh, an order of magnitude more difficult than many of the other uh, files that we're working on. We are engaged. I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Charlotte Mushtank and Katie to give an update as to where we stand and what we think needs to be done next. Thanks to the panelists before and thanks Martin for the, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to start off, we're going to give a bit of a rundown of what's going on in all the various IBOR jurisdictions by reference to the work that ICMA is involved in. And we are involved in all the different areas in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Asian markets, in Swiss, in the Euro markets, in the Sterling market. And we keep in very close contact with our peers in the US um, transition working groups. So we're truly representing a very international and joined up um, approach. Uh, with that, I'm going to make a start just talking about the adoption of risk-free rates um, in some of the main jurisdictions. And it's a good news story really for the uptake of risk-free rates globally. For SOFR, which is the risk-free rate alternative to US dollar LIBOR, we've seen issuance of approximately 760 billion notional in floating rate instruments tied to SOFR so far. And although we understand that there is still some issuance in US dollar LIBOR linked transactions, which are maturing beyond the end of 2021, we also understand that they should contain quite robust fallbacks to the risk-free rate in the event that um, US dollar LIBOR ceases. In the sterling market, the Sonia Link market, we've seen around 150 Sonia Link FRN issuances since mid-2018, which equates to approximately 64 billion sterling. Securitized issuance has also been healthy, and we understand that more and more investors are able to participate in Sonia Link transactions, and more and more issuers are accessing the markets, albeit mainly on the financial institution side. So it's very much on an upward trajectory. Issuance has maybe slowed down a bit over the last few months, but we think that's mainly due to market dynamics and issuers having already reached their funding volumes for the year. But I think it's an important point to say that Sonia is now fully embedded in the bond market and that public LIBOR issuance has pretty much ceased. 
EURSTR hasn't been used so much yet, but there's been a handful of transactions up to a notional value of approximately 4 billion. But then again, Euribor still exists and is being used. And the authorities are not planning to end it anytime soon, although they are making provision for its potential eventual demise, as to which there'll be some consultations coming out shortly. So, so far, so good for new issuance. There is, of course, a bit of a wrinkle, there always is, and this is in terms of the conventions which are being used and have been emerging between jurisdictions and also between products for which purposes I'm talking about cash products, such as loans and bonds. In the bond market, all bar a few of the transactions to date have been done on an observation lag basis, where each Sonia rate is weighted according to the number of days that apply in the interest period. The loan market also recently recommended using the observation lag approach for loans. But in August this year, the Bank of England started to produce a Sonia index, which is great because it's expected to assist with the reconciliation of interest amounts between parties, and it's easy to reference it in documentation. However, the use of the Sonia index is not compatible with the observation lag. It is compatible with what is known as the observation shift, where each Sonia rate is weighted according to the number of days that apply in the period during which Sonia is observed. So the observation lag approach is still fine for bonds, but with the advent of the Sonia index, it may well be that the bond market moves towards using the observation shift approach instead. As regards conventions in the SOFA market, there's been more of a, of a variety of conventions used. In the market, we don't think has yet settled on one particular format. So while alignment between products and jurisdictions has been an ambition, this divergence isn't necessarily a problem, but it's significant from a systems bill point of view, where different options may have to be overlaid. And of course, it's important that there's clear visibility for the market about which product is using which convention. So I'm going to hand over to Mushtaq just to give us a lowdown on the agent perspective. Mushtaq? Thank you, Katie. My name is Mushtaq. I represent the Asia Pacific region for ICMA, and we've been very active with uh, our members here in the region, as well as a couple of the um, chairs of our syndicate and legal committees in Asia talking about the benchmark issue. Now, in Asia Pacific, um, for better or for worse, most of the floating rate bond issuance in the international market is under US dollar LIBOR, uh, with some Japanese yen, but very, very little sterling and other currencies. Um, we are seeing some new issuance directly linked to SOFR, which is very good news, but we haven't had quite the, the resounding success that we've had in the UK market converting um, all new issuances to the risk-free rate. In fact, um, and somewhat worryingly, I would say, issuance does continue in US dollar-linked LIBOR um, in Asia, uh, particularly in the emerging markets. Uh, we do, I can cite a couple of figures, um, almost 200 billion US dollars, 198 billion of, of US, US dollars of LIBOR linked notes are still outstanding maturing from 2022 onwards um, across more than 600 issues. This is Bloomberg data. And a, quite a big portion of that was actually issued after January, 2019. Um, when the market was very well aware that LIBOR would cease to exist. Now, as Katie mentioned, um, a good portion, hopefully almost all of that uh, new issuance does have robust fallbacks that reference SOFR or um, the, the prevailing risk-free rate uh, that's going to exist after uh, LIBOR ceases to exist. But um, we, in our view, the, the um, continued issuance of LIBOR-linked uh, notes is still a little bit more risky, obviously, than, than issuing um, under the new risk-free rate. One more point I'll mention for Asia right up front is that a number of key Asian benchmarks are actually synthetic benchmarks that partly reference LIBOR for their own local purposes. So, for example, they'll reference, a, they'll apply a forward FX curve to the U.S. dollar LIBOR curve in local currency. And so when U.S. dollar LIBOR is no longer available, then these local benchmarks will no longer be able to be calculated. Um, and the key benchmarks that, uh, for which this is true um, are SOR in Singapore, Tabat Fix in Thailand, MIFOR in India, and PHI-REF 
in the Philippines. Now, fortunately, uh, local working groups and regulators in these jurisdictions are very much aware of the problem and working on uh, robust uh, risk-free rates and replacement rates for these US dollar LIBOR linked local benchmarks. Back to Charlotte. Thanks, Mushtaq, and thanks, Katie. Um, so I'm Charlotte Bellamy and uh, also work on, on risk-free rates um, at, at ICMA. Um, and I thought that now we might turn, having talked a little bit about um, adoption of risk-free rates and new issuance um, in both um, Europe and in Asia, uh, we might touch on the legacy problem, which Mushtaq also touched on, and in particular talk about the um, uh, what's known as the tough legacy or uh, legislative proposals that we've uh, seen put forward. Um, so I think that the, in terms of the general uh, issue surrounding the legacy uh, bond um, problem, should we call it, um, is now well known. So in terms of the fact that um, traditional fallbacks typically don't cater for permanent cessation of the relevant benchmark uh, and uh, legacy libel bonds are difficult to uh, amend or more difficult to amend than other asset classes. Um, that's now well known. And we've seen uh, three uh, separate legislative proposals that have been put forward, um, one in the US or more specifically for New York, uh, one in the EU and one in the UK. So uh, taking those in turn, in the US, uh, it's actually the ARC that has put forward a legislative proposal. So that's the um, body uh, that is um, sponsored by the Fed and is working on US dollar LIBOR transition. And they were the first to put forward a legislative proposal um, earlier this year. And the proposal, broadly speaking, is a statutory override of certain types of contracts uh, that reference US dollar LIBOR and where those contracts are governed by New York law. Um, it would seem that typical bonds uh, would likely to be uh, in scope of that proposal. Uh, and the override would be a um, to, to a, a rate and credit adjustment spread, i.e. The, the, the amount that's intended to um, reflect the difference between the old rate LIBOR and the new uh, replacement uh, risk-free rate, um, to uh, the, in, in each case that are recommended by the ARC or another um, official body. And there's also a, a statutory safe harbor, um, which is intended to protect uh, parties from litigation. So that was put forward earlier this year. It hasn't yet been enacted. Uh, and indeed, um, there are other priorities in the US, as we know at the moment, with their presidential elections coming up. So um, it remains to be seen in terms of the timing um, as to, to whether that will be enacted and indeed whether there may be any changes to it before it is enacted. Then in terms of the EU, uh, we saw this summer the European Commission put forward proposed amendments to the EU benchmarks regulation. Um, now, they've taken a, a, a similar approach to, to the ARC in terms of envisaging a statutory override of certain types of contracts to a rate that is uh, recommended by the European Commission or, or designated by the European Commission, I should say. Um, the, the precise scope is um, at this point uh, slightly more difficult to pin down. Uh, and indeed, that proposal is the subject of review and uh, negotiation among the EU co-legislators. So where that will end up still remains to be seen. It seems likely from, from what we've seen in terms of the, the public materials uh, that, that bonds, um, at least those bonds that will be governed by EU law or the, the law of an EU member state, um, are, are likely to be in scope, but, but there's still some uncertainty um, on, on exactly how this will all um, pan out and indeed on the timing for all of that. So we know that the EU would like to move quickly uh, and they've said that publicly, but what that actually means in practice is not entirely clear. Um, other um, quick fixes to EU legislation um, that have been made this year have um, happened in a matter of months, uh, but we'll, we'll have to wait to see uh, whether that happens in, for the benchmarks regulation as well. For the UK, uh, it, it's, um, they're in a unique position, of course, in that um, the LIBOR administrator, ICE benchmark administrator or IBA, is supervised by the UK FCA. And so they um, have taken a slightly different approach in terms of the proposal that we've seen 
from the UK authorities. And that was again put forward this summer, but we haven't yet seen how that will all be finalised uh, and, and indeed when it will be finalised. Um, but the proposal there is different in that the FCA would be empowered to um, direct IBA to um, change the methodology for LIBOR. So rather than a statutory override of contracts, there would be a change to the LIBOR methodology at source. Um, so what that might mean is that the FCA is able to direct um, IBA to, um, to produce what some people call synthetic LIBOR, or other people call modified LIBOR. Um, the FCA though has been very clear that that may not be possible in all circumstances, um, in particular where the relevant inputs um, are not available. So they are encouraging people to actively transition. Um, and, and what I would say as well is that um, taking a step back um, from a, a, a more sort of general perspective, it's very interesting from our perspective and important from our perspective to monitor how these proposals progress and the impact that they will have not um, just in terms of the, the sort of the, the economic results that they will achieve, um, which may end up being the same or similar, um, but just achieved by a different means, but also in terms of how they interact with each, with each other in terms of scope. Um, and that's really important, of course, because people need to know what will apply and when. Um, so I will um, stop there um, in, in terms of talking about the legislative proposals and just um, note again that, of course, while we're waiting for this all to happen, the authorities are encouraging people to uh, transition actively away from LIBOR. And this is where Katie comes in uh, with some comments on that. Uh, that's right, Charlotte, thank you. Um, so I think as we've already highlighted, the situation is slightly different in the US where, um, as mentioned, you need 100% bondholder unanimity to uh, ensure a successful consent solicitation to amend the interest rate pro uh, provisions of a bond. Uh, and this is considered to be too difficult to achieve. So the focus on the US is very much on the legislative solution. But in the UK, in the sterling market and under English law, the thresholds aren't quite so high and they're easier, much easier to achieve. And so there is a big push from the regulators in the UK to actively transition as many legacy transactions as possible now in advance of the legislative solution coming out. I think there's a number of reasons for this. Firstly, actively transitioning now ensures um, more certainty of the uh, economic outcome for the parties. So you, know, you, you can control what rate you're actually going to change to rather than have that imposed by legislation which also helps for hedging purposes as well, because you can change to whatever is in line with your derivative. Uh, secondly, to rely on the legislative solution might, well, it would be handing control of the economics to the legislative outcome, but the legislative solution might not be able to address all issues or be practicable in all circumstances. I mean, as Charlotte says, there are so many um, outstanding points that need to be nailed before we can actually see what it's going to look like. Thirdly, transitioning bonds before the cessation of LIBOR removes as much LIBOR risk from the financial system as possible and would help to ensure a more sort of smooth transition to the risk-free rate. So in the UK, there have been 21 successful consent solicitations undertaken to date in the starting market to amend the interest rate provisions of LIBOR bonds to a SONIA basis, and there are others which are in progress. They've all followed the same model substantially, so amending the interest rates from LIBOR to SONIA, plus a market agreed adjustment spread. But we estimate that there are approximately 750 separate ISINs which are for sterling LIBOR linked transactions. And those are the ones of which we are aware, there may be many, many more, which would all need to be amended to a risk-free rate. Um, and as many of you will know, to conduct a consent solicitation, it's time consuming, it's documentation intensive, and ultimately there's no guarantee of success. But in order to facilitate and further encourage more active transitions by way of consent solicitation, 
The Risk Free Rate Working Group in the UK has made available a paper on the active transition of LIBOR referencing bonds, and it has released recommendations for the proper conduct of consent solicitations based on the experience of other deals which have taken place. But clearly, there's still quite a bit to do, um, at, and, and further work is under consideration by the Risk Free Rate Working Group. So I'll hand over to Mushtaq now to give the Asian perspective. Thank you, Katie. And um, Katie described very different situations um, considering the US law and um, UK law or English law govern contracts um, that are linked to LIBOR. Um, and in Asia, it's a bit of a hybrid situation because you're seeing both. Where you see a lot of MTN programs uh, that are done under English law. You see a lot of US dollar LIBOR issuance um, where the contracts are under, under New York law. And so um, Asian uh, market participants have to consider um, both of the potential options, not only the potential for consent solicitations, but also the impact of the legislative solutions. And in Asia, unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to say this, but the situation is even more complex because not only do you have to consider uh, the, the, the differences between uh, the consent solicitation and the legislative solutions, you have to consider the different legislative solutions, and then you have to consider local law implications. And while in most of the Asian jurisdictions, of course, the contracts would be um, hopefully covered by the UK or US legislative solutions, um, it's not entirely clear yet how those might interact, perhaps negatively, with local laws around contracts, around the rights of uh, issuers and investors, around mis-selling, around these other um, tax and regulatory um, implications of these changes of contracts. One other point, moreover, is that um, in some Asian jurisdictions, such as China, for example, there are master agreements that are under local law. And so these um, agreements would presumably fall outside of any legislative solutions um, that are done internationally. So these are just some of the general issues in Asia that the market is trying to figure out. Now, where do we go from here? Um, the mar the well, fortunately, one point I think that is uh, a very good news is that all of the um, official sector authorities, in particular the central banks in Asia, and I mean across um, all significant markets here, are very much engaged now. And um, even if some of them started later than others, um, you know, from Australia to China and um, over to India and everywhere in between, um, the central banks are pushing the market very hard to find solutions to the problems of legacy contracts and um, um, of, of fallback language. And they've made it very clear that the will not be legislative solutions um, at the national level in Asia that the market is responsible for finding a way to solve these problems. Now I'll leave the last word to Katie and Charlotte uh, for the next steps around the world. Well, Mushtaq, I suppose I can only just uh, echo uh, what you've said in terms of your work in Asia. We'll also be uh, tracking very closely um, the legislative solutions um, in Europe and beyond uh, and uh, engaging with, with members uh, and, um, and indeed the official sector to uh, try to ensure that clarity of scope that uh, I mentioned earlier on and indeed the clarity of, of outcome as well. Katie? In terms of what is left to achieve, I think there's still a number of technical aspects to be worked through, such as an official recommendation of a successor rate for LIBOR and finalizing details of the um, market adjustment spread so that fallbacks which are intended to operate to the risk-free rate as opposed to falling back to a fixed rate can actually operate smoothly in accordance with their terms. Uh, and as we've said, there's a lot to do on active transition in order to reduce the number of LIBOR referencing bonds outstanding, including uh, a consideration of what can possibly be done to make the process easier. And there's a huge amount, as there always is, to be done in terms of just raising awareness across all segments of the market of the issues that are associated with LIBOR. It's gratifying to hear you know, globally that awareness is heightened and people are now starting to really think about things. Um, so people, I think it, there is a big exercise just so that, you know, the, the message is that people need to act soon. Um, so I, I think that probably just about sums it up from us on risk-free rate transition. But I would urge everyone to keep an eye on the dedicated pages of our website um, and also just to look through our quarterly report, 
quarterly, obviously, because we always have features on the transition to risk-free rates. And of course, please just fire any one of us an email at any time. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Martin. Great. Well, look, thank you very much. I said at the outset, this is a very complex uh, area with lots of interdependencies, and I hope that that's come through loud and clear from Katie, Mushtak and Charlotte. We continue to be very, very heavily involved here and uh, we'll keep you all up to date. Also, there is an enormous amount of information on a specific hub on LIBOR transition on our website, but any of the um, uh, those three would be very, very um, pleased to field any particular questions that you might have. Right, well, that really does bring us to the end of this uh, primary market forum. I personally, I've very much enjoyed listening to what I think have been excellent pals and, uh, and speakers. It's um, an exceptionally exciting time in the primary markets. This has been possibly the most unusual year we've ever experienced in the primary markets, but they've been absolutely um, performing as they should in terms of um, enabling the intermediation of capital from those who have it to those who need it in the real economy, never more important than it is at the moment, given the um, recovery that's needed at the end of the pandemic. And uh, it's very, very good to see that the, the major themes are really growing in importance. And the things I picked up, clearly almost every single uh, panel uh, one ever speaks to these days is talking about the the mega trend of sustainability and this sustainability overlay the way that this is becoming mainstream in the capital markets for us is very exciting and I think creates a lot of challenge but an enormous amount of opportunity we're seeing a huge number of new developments on the market side on the product side as well with the sustainability linked bonds there is a lot of regulatory intervention coming through a lot of detailed work that needs to be done in terms of the new legislation. Uh, we're seeing the, as I said earlier, the explosive growth of the, uh, the social COVID-19 themed bond market. And there is overall huge momentum. And my observation is that ESG is now really becoming much more multifaceted than it was six, nine, 12 months ago, where it really was dominated by the environmental issues. Now it's much more balanced. And I think that's uh, been highly complimentary and will only be going one way. We discussed in one of the panel the, uh, the fintech impacts. Again, this is a, a huge theme. The, um, the capital markets uh, are looking at a lot of these uh, new solutions that are coming through. Again, that creates an enormous amount of opportunity for um, efficiency, for progress, as well as some challenges for the um, practitioners in the capital market to deal with all this and also to decide amongst all of the various different initiatives which ones really have legs and which ones are, are, are worth focusing on and uh, spending some IT resource perhaps getting to grips with and uh, uh, dealing with internally. A lot of focus this year on market practice developments as well. I commented earlier on that we've updated uh, 200 pages of the uh, primary market handbook, which deals with market practice. And uh, that will be a, a continuing theme. Um, it was interesting to hear the focus on liquidity coming out from the corporate issuers, uh, particularly on as the COVID pandemic hit and uh, the dash for cash and the issues around uh, short-term finance and then moving more into long-term finance, stabilization of the bond markets as the central banks pumped liquidity into the market in unprecedented, at unprecedented scale. A um, lot of issuers for, uh, a lot of um, um, issues for um, issuers to deal with. Um, we picked up on some of those, obviously issues around the pandemic, but also there's been a, a multiplicity of geopolitical issues to deal with and navigate one's way around. And they're still not over, certainly for this year. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next um, next three to uh, three weeks and onwards. And we picked up um, something which is not very often discussed, but that was the the uh, extraordinary developments about the oil price earlier this year. But through it all, as I said, the the primary markets have played an absolutely key role 
in the way that they've been intermediating capital. And I think that's something to be uh, very proud of for all of the primary market participants. It's operated effectively and efficiently, even whilst the vast majority of participants have been working remotely, and many of them do still continue to work remotely. So with that, I'd like to thank um, all the panelists and speakers. I'd like to thank in particular my colleagues, and you know who they are, for putting this together and for all the work that they do in serving this constituency of primary market specialists, investors, issuers, and, uh, and of course the intermediaries, the underwriting banks, as well as the uh, market infrastructures working constructively with law firms and others to make sure that this market works as efficiently as it possibly can. With that, I'd like to draw this um, um, primary market forum to a close. Thank you all very much for attending, and I do hope that uh, you found it productive. Thank you all.